I want to tell you guys a story, right? Who knows that I love to tell stories? I'm a storyteller. I, I enjoy that. I'm going to take you guys back to when I was in prison. If you're a first time guest here, I've been to prison, just FYI. That's a great way to introduce myself. Um, hi, I'm Pastor Andrew. I don't like dwell on it. It was almost 10 years ago, but I spent 18 months in prison. And um, while in prison, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about segregation. I learned a lot about gangs. I learned a lot about politics inside of the prisons. Inside of prisons, they have their own ecosystem. They have their own government inside. And where I was in prison was Oregon. And in Oregon, uh, it's not very diverse. It's not a, a diverse state. So when you go to prison, you have your whites, you have your blacks, you have your Mexicans. And it doesn't matter what gang affiliation you're a part of, the Bloods, the Crips, the GDs, uh, are all together. All of the Mexican gangs, the Sorinos and the Norteños, they're together, right? And then all of the white gangs are together. Now we intermingle, we hang out, we play ball, we lift weights, we do those things. But if something were to happen, right, you run to the group that you are most closely affiliated with. Now, I wasn't in a gang, okay? Um, but the guys who I hung out with were. And I was curious about the application process. Um, I was like, well, how do, you, how do you join? Do you submit a resume? Do, is there a 401k? Are there benefits? Does it come with dental? Like what, what, what how, how do I join the gang? What qualifications are you looking for? And is there any opportunity for advancement? And they were like, bro, you are not cut out for this gang life. And um, I had to agree, uh, I was not. And so, although I hung out with them one of my closest friends, his name was Paper. He goes by Paper Chase. That's his handle. And uh, Paper would always say, hey, man, are you staying peed up? Are you staying peed up? And I'm just like, yeah, man, I'm peed up from the feet up. And I had no idea what I was saying, but I didn't want to act. I didn't want to stand out and be the guy who's just like, oh, bro, what do you mean by am I peed up? That doesn't make sense. And so one day after, I'm just like, I need to know what it is that I'm claiming. I could be claiming something really big bad. And so I pull him aside. I'm like, bro, what does peed up mean? And this isn't even like a gang thing. There's five P's in prison and it stands for proper preparation prevents poor performance. Okay. Let me say that again. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. And he's saying, Hey, are you prepared? Is everybody prepared? Is everybody locked in? And I'm like, well, sure, I, I guess I, I am. I'm, I'm locked in. I'm prepared. I loved it because I come from CrossFit, a CrossFit background. In CrossFit, one of the things that you do is you train for GPP, general physical preparedness. Ideally, what you train for CrossFit is that if a bear was chasing us, I am physically prepared to leave one of you slower people behind so I don't get eaten by the bear right? My, are you down with GPP? I'm down with GPP. Yeah, you know me. I'm going to be, I'm going to leave you behind. Okay. I'm going to leave you behind. So five P's in prison, proper preparation prevents poor performance. This is actually a quote by James Baker, who's secretary of the state. Somehow it infiltrated its way into gang life and gang talk. And that's what we did. Now, what were they preparing for? Okay. Probably not the same thing that I was preparing for. Uh, they were preparing for riots. They were preparing for war. They were preparing for fights, meaning that they were properly preparing and preventing their poor performance. They had toothbrushes that they were using for shanks. They had metal bars that were sharpened. They had strategy. They knew where the guards were. They had time. They had all of this stuff collected. Their approach was militant. It was strategic. It was organized. They were like soldiers ready for war. So I learned about proper preparation. And so today, that's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about preparation. And as I was preparing this message and sitting in prayer, I hear God tell me, right? And not in like an audible voice. I promise you, I'm not like just hearing voices by myself, but he tells me, equip and prepare my people. Equip. As a pastor, I'm called to equip and prepare the people through the word, through the scripture. And so I ask myself, well, God, how can I prepare the people? Right? I'm a guy who's been to prison. I got a past. I've gone through these things. I'm not your normal pastor. I don't have the qualifications or the accolades or the achievements or the awards. How can I do so? And I heard him clearly say, through the revelation of the Holy Spirit and through collaboration, 
the revelation of the Holy Spirit and collaboration. And what do I mean by that? I can help prepare and equip you guys through the revelation of what God speaks to me and then partnering with others to help get you guys the information that you need, to get you guys the, the resources, to get you guys the training. And so if you think about a championship organization, we'll just say the Los Angeles Lakers, okay? We'll just, we're just gonna, I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna go any, we'll just say, do I got any Lakers fans in the house? Yeah, 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 we got a couple, we got a couple. So a championship organization like the Lakers is a team. And on that team, there are several different pieces that come together collectively to make them a championship team. You have shooting coaches, you have dribbling coaches, you have team trainers who wrap ankles, you have dietitians, you have strength coaches, endurance coaches, you have plyometric coaches, you have scout teams, head coaches, assistant coaches. The list goes on from players to water boys. And so in order for this organization to be as dominant as it is and to be this championship organization, it takes collaboration. It's more than just the five players that are on the court. And so in the, in the same way that these championship organizations are built, I hear God saying that if we want to build something that's lasting and impactful and will take this city for the name of Jesus, it's going to be through the revelation of the Holy Spirit and through collaboration. And so I want to share with you guys that this Thursday, we're collaborating with a friend of mine. His name's Chris Rickstrew. He's here with us in attendance. On Thursday, we're starting a purpose and calling workshop, okay? You guys can clap for that. I think that's really, really good. So this is where all the skepticals are like, oh, he's going to ask us for money. <laughs> uh, no, because it's free. This is a free seven-week course. This is a workshop. This course is valued at $1,500 per person. He does this in a corporate setting. He does this with people who make probably a lot more money than most of us, not all of us, but most of us. And he works with these individuals and he helps them find their purpose and their calling. And he has gifted this seven-week course to Royal City Church the very first time he's collaborated with a ministry and is willing to do that. So this is free, I'm not asking for anything, but he will be in the lobby when we're done. He's, got, uh, he's gonna have it set up. If you guys wanna get signed up, don't, like even if you're not a member, you're a first time guest. If you take anything, you're like, I don't like the pastor. He's, you know, he's kinda weird and worship with, ah. at least do the, the purpose and calling thing. Like it's free, it's free. So prepare yourself, not asking for anything. Who in here is wondering what their purpose is? Maybe wrestling with that, or maybe they're calling. Go ahead and raise your hand. It's okay. Like if you're like, man, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what my calling is. I'm wrestling in this season of life. Make sure you sign up. This is where you want to be over the next seven weeks. I'm excited to dive in. I believe that it's going to give us direction. It's going to give us guidance. I believe this is a revelation from the Holy Spirit. And this is how we get to where it is that God's calling us through collaboration. Amen. All right, I promise we're gonna preach, but I wanna share one more story. Are you guys okay with the stories that I tell? Like, some of you guys wanna know more about prison, huh? Yeah. So when I was at, no, I'm not gonna go into it. I, I, I yeah, well, I may not say what I was gonna say um, because the feds are watching and I don't wanna get myself in trouble. That stuff, there's, there's a statute of limitation and it hasn't passed yet, it hasn't passed yet. So before I can do my tell-all story, um, I gotta let some time go by. So. Not only did I go to prison, but I went to college. I got two college degrees, and it's kind of like this weird dichotomy of a little bit of holy, a little bit of hood. Um, I've experienced a lot of life, but well, while I was in college, I went out for the basketball team, and uh, I made the college basketball team. This is my freshman year. And on my, my freshman year, I didn't make it as a starter. And so we go to this first tournament. It's a non-sanctioned tournament. Uh, we're playing some teams. I'm coming off the bench. We play two games, I get some decent minutes, I play pretty well, but the third game of the tournament, we lost our first two games, the coach gives me a chance to start on the third day. And I'm like, oh, let's go. So we get out there, I play really well, we win the game. The next week, grades came back, okay? Their starting center, who was a, a scholarship player, he had a full ride scholarship, didn't make his grades and he got cut from the team. Guess who got moved up to start the very next game? And for the rest of the season and then the next season after that. And guess who got their scholarship? Yeah. I did, I did. Oh, you guys are clapping like this just happened, bro. This is, this is a glory day story. This happened over a decade ago, right? Roll my highlight tape. No, I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna. I won't, I won't bore you guys to death with that, that's embarrassing. Uh, so the reason why I had that opportunity is because I was prepared. 
I was prepared. I showed up to every practice, even knowing that I wasn't a starter. I made sure that when the opportunity arose, I was ready to step into what it was that was in front of me. And in the same way, what I want is for you guys to be prepared. I don't know what lies on the other side of that door. It could be grief, it could be hurt, it could be pain, it could be heartbreak, it could be joy and peace and abundance. But regardless of what lies on the other side of that door, if you're not prepared, you're not gonna be able to handle it. Because a blessing can come that you haven't paid your dues on, you might not be prepared, you might not be able to steward those things. And, and in the same way, I want you guys to have a grasp of how to handle whatever it is that comes your way. So my question to you is, are you prepared? Are you ready? And are you using your time wisely? Let's pray and then jump into the word. We're actually gonna preach from the word of God today. So Father God, first and foremost, the glory, praise, and honor belong to you. I pray that as we enter into a time of devotion and teaching, that you would soften our hearts, that you would open our ears, open our eyes, and that you would allow us to be receptive to your Holy Scripture. Lord, challenge us, change us, and transform us. Holy Spirit, have your way with us. I pray, God, that you would make your word applicable to my brothers' and sisters' situations, whatever they're going through, that your word would come alive and that it would cut like the two-edged sword that it is, that it would pierce their heart, that it would pierce their problems, that they would be reminded that you, God, are good, that you are great, that you are holy and righteous, and that it is not a coincidence that they've stepped foot in this place because you've got a word for them. God, I pray that you would give me the words to speak, that they would, they would come off clear and that there would be no confusion, that I wouldn't preach from a place of my flesh, but only led by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. God, honor, praise, and glory belong to you. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. and amen. Woo, okay. You guys ready? Yes. I'm not gonna start with the Bible verse. I'm gonna start with a quote. One of my favorite quotes is from Abraham Lincoln, and it should be up here in just a second. It says, give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. Anybody ever heard that quote? right? Before I go out and do something, I'm going to spend the majority, four out of the six hours, preparing myself before ever taking on that task. I'm going to ready myself, mind, body, spirit. I'm going to prepare for whatever God has for me. I want to share that um, my personal routine, this is going to irritate the life out of some of you guys because you're not going to be able to relate because the life that I live is just a little different. So I wake up at 4 a.m. every morning, Sunday through Sunday, like every day. Maybe sometimes if I sleep in, I sleep until 4.35, right? Maybe some of you guys can relate to that. Immediately upon waking, I start praying and thanking God. I'm grateful. If my eyes are open and I find myself on the other side, on this side of eternity, I haven't been taken away. I'm grateful for that. Even if my money ain't right, I might be fighting with my wife, uh, whatever's going on, I'm still grateful that I get another opportunity to make things right. Somehow this is getting caught on something. But after I wake up and pray and start thanking God, I stumble downstairs and I chug 12 ounces of water. That makes, like, you gotta know what I'm doing. I'm getting really intense. I chug 12 ounces of water. I make my coffee. I take my supplements. And then I spend, this is, this is what makes me really holy and really qualified. Pay attention. I spend the next hour reading my Bible, my devotional. I read 10 pages from two different books at the same time. Not at the same time, not like book to book, but like I read 10 and then I read 10. That would make me really holy. And then... I run coffee and prayer, which is a Bible study. If we don't have Bible study or coffee and prayer, then I do some office work or social media stuff for about an hour and a half. And then I go to the gym at nine. I lift for an hour and then I play basketball for an hour and a half. And then I sit in the sauna and then I stretch. And you might be like, pastor, bro, I got a job, dog. Like I can't do what, four o'clock in the morning. Like I've got to pay bills. I've got to go. Like I've got a life, first off, that isn't what you're doing. Or you might even be thinking, must be nice. I wish that I could do that. I'll say this. 
This has always been my routine. This is my routine when I built manufactured homes. This was my routine when I was in prison. This was my routine when I owned my own gym. I've always valued the morning hours. I love getting up early. I love filling my cup. I love sharpening my ax before I go out and approach whatever's laying out there ahead of me. I feel more prepared to handle issues, obstacles, stress, hurt, and pain when I spend the first part of my day preparing my spirit to handle whatever it is comes my way. And so I want to share with you guys this idea, and it's not popular, but there's an old saying that says, we make time for the things that are important to us. And if there's a will, there's a way. And so I want to show you the way. And the way is Jesus. The way is prayer. The way is gratitude. The way is devotion. The way is worship. And so I have a routine that I do every single day that prepares me so that it prevents poor performance. Amen? Even the Bible speaks to this. This is where some of you guys are like, we have been here for 20 minutes. This man hasn't used one scripture. I promise you, you're about to get it all right now. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10, it says this. Using a dull ax requires great strength. We're still using this ax analogy. So sharpen the blade. That's the value of wisdom. It helps you succeed. I don't know why you're here coming into relationship with Jesus. Hopefully it's for salvation, it's to be in his presence, it's to worship him. But whatever ulterior motive has you here, if at the very least it's for him to help you succeed or to help you be blessed, I want to help you guys have a deeper understanding of how you can put into practice some things that will prepare you for the day. And in doing so, it's you exercising wisdom and making sure that you guys are ready. Are you tired of banging your head against the wall? It talks about sharpening the ax, but some of you have a dull head that's banging up against the wall, doing the same old thing, expecting different results. The idea here is when you know better, you should do better. And so I want to help you guys succeed. The Bible says multiple times to stay awake, to pay attention, to be aware, to be alert, to be watchful, to be ready. In essence, it's telling you to what? Be prepared, be prepared. And what I see is so many people who aren't prepared, they wake up and go about their day without prayer, without worship, without devotion, without gratitude, and then wonder why it seems like their entire lives are falling apart. You haven't tapped into the source. You're running on an empty battery. You're not plugging in to the life. You're not plugging into the light. You're not plugging into the truth. You're not plugging in to the way. So how do you prepare for the day? How do you prepare for the obstacles that lie ahead? How do you prepare for the battle? Even the world understands this. I was in prison, five Ps, and they're prepared for whatever lies ahead. The world understands the power of preparation. You can get on any positive encouragement podcast in here that they're gonna tell you, first thing you should do is make your bed, and then you should meditate, and then you should say a mantra. And then you should do your deep breathing. And then you should drink your apple cider vinegar. And then you should drink your lemon water. And then read 10 pages. Like the, the world does this. And as Christians tapped into the eternal source, all knowledge, all wisdom, ignore this as if it's an option. And then wonder why our lives feel like they're falling apart. Even the world, it's New Year's resolutions and challenges, 75 hard, right? Dry January, I'm not going to have a drink of alcohol. Like if that's your challenge, we got bigger problems. If you're like, yeah, I'm, and that's not a judgment, right? I want you to come as you are, but like whatever helps lead you in the right direction, sugar-free January, red January. You've anybody heard of that? Run every day. Red stands for run every day. No, thank you. I don't want to <laughs> run every day, every day. The way my knees are set up, uh, and they call it Janu run. Like, no, absolutely not. The world understands the idea of calling themselves higher, preparing themselves, challenging themselves, pushing themselves. And in the church, we've gotten so comfortable with just showing up, not being challenged, not being pushed, not calling each other higher, not holding each other accountable. And so what I'm about to share with you guys, I've shared before, but this is the revised 2.0 version. And there's so many new people, you might not have ever heard it. But I, I shared something last year, or maybe even the year before, called the core four. Does anybody remember, did, was did anybody hear the core four? 
I got one. That's good because this is a new message. All right, yeah, let's go. If like all of you raised your hands, I'd be like, oh, here we go. But the core four is this. Communication. So it's an acronym, C-O-R-E, all right? This is how you should start your day. This is how you prepare for whatever's lying before you. C is communication. O is observation. R is reading. And E is exaltation. So we start our day, and the way I start my day, whether it's three hours or three minutes, it starts with prayer, communication. It starts with observation, which is gratitude, observing the fact that I'm here and got a roof over my head. The, the, the R is devotion. You're reading your word, whether it's one scripture, one chapter, or one whole book. But we start this day intentionally, and the E is exaltation, or another word for that is worship. And what I'm telling you right now, these aren't the five Ps, this is the core four. If you start your day communicating to God, observing his presence and being thankful for what he's got, you start reading his word and worshiping him, I promise you that your situation will change. And if your situation doesn't change, something inside of you will. Amen? The core four. And you're like, well, Pastor Andrew, that's a real motivational speech. No, because scripture backs up what I'm saying. There was an amazing man by the name of Jesus who modeled how we should approach our day. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. God in the flesh, Jesus, took time in the morning and prayed. He made it a part of his daily routine. He prayed. He got up before everybody else, and he prayed. How many of us are making that a priority? How many of us understand the privilege of what prayer actually is? You have an opportunity to speak to the creator of all things, and many of us treat it as it's this flippant obligation, as if, oh, I've got to pray, I've got to pray. No, when I open my eyes, it's thank you, God. That's prayer. I'm communicating openly and honestly and transparently and vulnerability. Let me tell you this. You think that what you have to say to God is too much for him to handle? You can take your disappointments, your discouragement, your heartbreak, your pain, your fear, your worry. If you're taking it anywhere else, I'm sorry to tell you, it's not, there's nothing's going to change. You need to take those things in prayer, which is communication straight to God. And it starts every single morning. And the extreme example of my personal routine, this can happen in a matter of five minutes. You can do all core four. You can do these in a matter of four minutes, a minute each. I'm not asking you to stop and to get on your knees and to turn off all the lights and to have music in the background and light a candle. I'm saying it's just communication. The O, observation or gratitude. Scripture says in Psalms chapter one, or Psalm 143, verse eight. Let me hear of your unfailing love each morning, for I am trusting you. Show me where to walk, for I give myself to you. Each morning, I want to give myself to God. He woke me up. I am thankful for that. And so, Lord, because you put breath in my lungs, every breath that I breathe is yours. Use me as you see fit. Take me, lead me, guide me. Every single morning. Mm. Devotion. Now, this isn't going to be on a slide, but I need you guys to, I'm going to read six verses. This is from Psalm chapter one, talking about reading and devotion. Now, the way I want to frame this is the passion that the author of this psalm, I'm going to read you guys six verses, and the passion that he has for the scripture and for being with God. I devote every morning to getting in his presence. How many of you feel like God's not listening or doesn't hear you? but then have your Bible closed, right? He's not speaking. He's not saying anything. You guys open your word. In Psalm chapter one, verses one through six, it says this, what delight comes to the one who follows God's ways? A delight. When you follow his ways, when you say no to the world, when you say no to sin, and you start to follow his ways, there's a delight. When you communicate with him, when you observe who he is, when you start to read your Bible, when you start to worship him, there is a delight there is a joy that surpasses all understanding. I, I'm telling you, not because, not because I want anything from you guys, right? Jesus changed my life. He transformed me. 
And so I'm up here on fire for the Lord because all I want is for you to experience the same relationship that I have. I'm, I'm not asking for anything. I don't have a, a, a link in my bio. This isn't an affiliate thing. I'm not trying to sign you up for anything. I'm trying to get you excited about the scripture because I delight in this and it's changed my life. And I want you guys to have some of this too. It says, what delight comes to the one who follows God's ways? He won't walk in step with the wicked, nor share the sinner's way, nor be found sitting in the scorner's seat. His passion is to remain true to the word of I am, meditating day and night on the true revelation of light. He's passionate. The one who meditates on this word is passionate. In verse three, it says, he will be standing firm like a flourishing tree planted by God's design, deeply rooted by the brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season of life. I read what a lot of, so last service, maybe you weren't here, but we had a Christmas tree up here and we're gonna get a little more into detail about that. But I asked people what it is that they wanna leave in 2023. And I invited people to write the three things that they wanted to leave in 2023 on those candy canes. And they hung them on the tree. And it was a public declaration that I'm leaving these in 2023. Well, Kyra and I, there's no names on them, so you guys weren't exposed. Uh, I know some of you are like, oh no, they read my candy cane. No, we read them all. Um, and we, she created a spreadsheet. I did not. She created a spreadsheet and organized it by the need and what people were wrestling with and what people wanted to leave behind. And from that, I know that some of you don't feel like you're standing firm. Some of you don't feel like you're deeply rooted. Some of you have no delight. Some of you have no passion, no excitement. Some of you have no calling or purpose. And this isn't me just throwing it out there, hoping it catches. The vast majority of the people who put something on the tree lines up with this. And so it tells me that you guys are looking for truth. You're looking for life. You're looking for purpose. You're searching for calling. You're looking for meaning. And what I'm here to tell you is that the word of God provides everything that it is that you're searching for. I would clap if I were you because that right there is a moment. I'm speaking truth to you this morning. And maybe you're, this is your first time. I'm not yelling at you guys. Uh, it might come off like this guy's been in prison. He's super intense. He's like yelling at me. I'm never coming back to that church. No, Jesus really changed my life, like legit. And this is a passion and a hunger that I want to impart unto you guys. Again, not trying to get anything from you, trying to get something inside of you. That's it. I'm trying to get this inside of you, in your life. I'm trying to convince you that if you would do these things, these core four, if you would communicate to God, if you would observe his presence and start practicing gratitude, if you would start reading this and you would start worshiping him, if your situation doesn't change, your heart will. It says that he is never dry. I'm not done reading this scripture. He is never dry, never fainting, ever blessed, ever prosperous. But how different are the wicked, right? You have the one who is in the word, in the presence of God, spending time with him, intimate, an intimate relationship with Jesus. And then you have those who aren't. It says, how different are they? They're like chaff blown away by the wind. The wicked will not endure to the day of judgment. Nothing they do will succeed or endure for long, for they have no part with those who walk in truth. But how different it is for the righteous. The Lord embraces their paths as they move forward while the way of the wicked leads only to doom. <laughs> Sounds like a no-brainer to me. Doesn't seem like I need a whole lot of convincing. I don't know about you, but I wanna walk in the way of the righteous. I wanna live a life that's sold out to the Lord. That's what I want. What about you? The E of the core four, we have communication, observation, reading, and exaltation. Again, a fancy word for worship. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 and 29, it says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. We worship God not because he's answered all of our prayers according to our expectations, because if you haven't found out by now, he will not answer all of your prayers according to your expectations. Many of us will pray for things. We want specific things and they might not ever come to pass. And so our worship shouldn't be dependent on what we receive from him. Our worship 
should be because we are grateful, because we have adopt, we've been adopted into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Our, 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 our part in eternity is no longer eternal separation from God. Our part in eternity is worship of God, is sitting in his presence. And so because of what he did and because of who he is, like we worship, we're worshiping him, not because of what he's done, although he's done some amazing things, we worship him because of who he is. We have received a kingdom that will not be shaken, even if your heart's broke, even if your money ain't right, even if you're struggling in your health, even if you've lost somebody, you're going through grief, whatever the world throws at you to try to shake your faith, we continue to worship him because the kingdom that we've inherited will not be shaken. I want to talk with you guys about the five issues, the top five issues that came back from the Christmas tree. The top five issues that came back from our last service when we asked, what are you leaving in 2023? Uh, the first one was anger and frustration, right? It was a mixture. Like, I'm leaving anger in 2023 or I'm leaving frustration. We combined those. That was by far the biggest one. The second one, the second thing was fear. People wanted to leave fear in 2023. The third thing was anxiety. People want to leave anxiety, anxiousness in 2023. This one surprised me. Number four, uh, laziness and procrastination. That tells me that there's a lot of people out there who probably feel called but aren't doing anything about it. There's a lot, that tells me that there's a lot of people who might know what they, they, they know what God wants them to do, but they're being lazy or they're procrastinating. They're waiting till Monday. They're waiting until the time is right. They're waiting till their finances are this, or they're waiting till they meet the right, right? They're, they're procrastinating. But I want to remind you guys too, that delayed obedience is still disobedience. And we've talked about that before. Me saying, ah, I'll do it later. That's disobedience if God's calling you to do it now. That's not the sermon, so I'm going to stay on track. I could preach about that. Number five, negative thoughts and self-talk, negative self-talk. So what was revealed to me is that we've got some mad, scared, anxious, unmotivated pessimists who don't know who they are in Christ Jesus. These are, these are men and women in the crowd. Some of you might identify with this. You might be thinking to yourself, that's me. I'm fearful. I'm angry. I'm anxious. I'm procrastinating. I'm dragging my feet. I hear God calling. I hear the Holy Spirit calling me out of darkness, but I'm making excuses on why I need to stay where I'm at. And then that negative self-talk, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not qualified enough. I can never do that. I can't talk to them. I can't speak like that. I didn't go to this school. I've got too much of a past. Well, what if they find out about what I did 10 years ago? Like there's that negative self-talk. Today, we're going to shake that lie off. We're shaking that lie off. We're shaking that lie off. <laughs> who, who, who thought of Taylor Swift, right? Shake it off, shake it, no, no, just me? Lies, hey, number six, lies. Leave lies in 2023, because I know more than one of you thought Taylor Swift. Don't do that to me. Leave me up here by myself. Mad, scared, anxious, unmotivated, pessimistic liars. It's crazy. Do me a favor and let's stand. Worship, you guys can go ahead and start to make your way up here. We're shaking off that lie because we are new creations in Christ Jesus. Jesus didn't just come to fix your stuff. He came to give you a new life. And so many of us are listening to the lies of the enemy, thinking that he's just here to fix us. When that was never his intention, you are new. You are not fear. You are not anxiety. You are not pessimistic or anxious. The, that is not who you are. The enemy would love nothing more than to keep you stuck in that old identity. But you have been called out of that because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't, don't clap at my words. Clap at the finished work of the cross. The finished work of the cross. Jesus did this. And so this is going to be my last story and the band can start. It's going to be one of those emotional stories that, you know, I'm not going to ask for anything with this emotional manipulation. But when I was a kid, 
I'm not, I can't just breeze past that. Uh, you know how churches do, right? And they'll roll like a B-roll of hungry kids. They were like, just for $5, I promise you, man, no, no. Pastor's pulling up in a G-Wagon, like, I got the 2009 Jeep out there. I got an old beat up Jeep, been driving it for 10 years. You don't got to worry where our money's going. It's going back to the people. So when I was a kid, my mom wrestled with addiction. Um, and I found myself in NA or AA meetings from time to time, right? I hated going to those meetings because it smelled in there and it was long and all they did were complain about their situation. I hated it. But one thing that really stood out to me when I was in those meetings is the serenity prayer. Has anybody heard the serenity prayer or heard of the serenity prayer? Now, I have nothing against NA or AA. It actually has helped my mom uh, accumulate. I believe she's going on five or six years of, uh, of being sober. I wish she was here so she could hear that, but she's been clean for, for some time because of the, the NA and the AA, the accountability, and she's come into a right relationship with Jesus. So pairing those up have been great. But look, the serenity prayer is something that I think is powerful. All prayer is powerful, but the serenity prayer goes like this. It says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I'm talking about preparation because preparation as we're starting this new year are things that you can change. If you find it important, you're going to find time to make it happen. If it's on your radar and you're like, I need to communicate, I need to observe with gratitude, I need to do a better job of reading, and I need to do a better job of worship, then you can do that. And I pray that you have the discernment to know that it's nobody's stopping you from stepping into that relationship except for yourself. The Bible says that if you knock, he will open. If you search, you will find. If you ask, you'll receive. So if you're in this place and you say, God, I want a relationship with you, help that fire to ignite deep down inside of me so that we can enter into a place of communication, observation, a deeper level of devotion through reading, and I want to worship you. I believe today he'll do it. That's one thing I believe he will do today. And so I'm asking you guys in this serenity prayer, serenity means calm or peaceful. I know I haven't been preaching calm or peaceful because I'm fired up, but I want to switch gears. He's saying, God, grant me the peace. Help me to calmly and understandably accept the things that I cannot change because there's some things that can't change. There's some things in our life that are solid. They've happened. But there's things that you are in complete control of. And I'm praying that you have the courage to change those things today, to implement these core four, to start diving into a deeper relationship with the Lord. Listen to me. There's some things that need to change in your lives and you know what they are. I, I, don't, I can't sit here and call it out and say, oh, this is what it is. You know. Even right now, I believe that the Holy Spirit is revealing to you that there are areas in your life, there are things that need to change. And I'm asking that you would receive the courage from God to take the steps necessary to make those changes. Maybe it's your morning routine and implementing the core four. Maybe it's stepping into a small group and getting yourself connected. Maybe you've had your walls up and you've been a lone wolf Christian. Oh, I don't really do church. I just kind of do spirituality on my own with no accountability, with no guidance, not having to answer to a spiritual mother or father. That's a recipe for disaster. Oh, well, I just watch sermons online. Stop dodging it. Get into something. Get into a small group. Maybe even now God's asking you to step into serving and maybe not here the kingdom in, at large and in general. And like I said, maybe it's just lowering your walls and entering into relationship with brothers and sisters in this place, getting to know somebody on a deeper, more intimate level. Go ahead and bow your heads. I don't know what those next steps of courage look like for each and every one of you, but if you're in this place and you wanna take a step of courage towards change and transformation, I want to encourage you to raise your hand. I'm not asking for anything. If you're like, today I publicly declare, and there's nobody looking. Everybody's looking at their toes right now. It's just you and God. Would you be willing to publicly declare with only God watching that you recognize today that things need to change and you're willing to partner with the Holy Spirit and allow him into your heart to start that beautiful work?
I'm gonna give you guys one more chance. You can lift that hand on the count of three. One, two, three, and say, yes, Lord, I receive. Yes, Lord, I need to change. Yes, Lord, give me the discernment to make the changes necessary. Amen. We're gonna enter into a time of worship and praise. And uh, before we do that, I just wanna say a prayer. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, first and foremost, I just wanna say thank you, Lord. And I publicly declare as a leader, as a teacher, and as a pastor that I want to be an example of what it looks like of, to, to be prepared. Uh, uh, an example of what it looks like to live sold out to you and to so, be sold out for you. I just pray for my brothers and sisters and everyone who had the courage to raise their hand and to say, yes, Lord, I can be more prepared. Yes, Lord, I can be more alert. Yes, Lord, there are areas in my life where I need the Holy Spirit to change and transform me. I'm praying by the power of the blood and in the mighty name of Jesus that you would impart that same consistency and that discipline, that you would help them to be prepared. God, I'm praying in the name of Jesus that you would give them strength and endurance. God, that you would help them to see who they are in you. God, I'm asking, Lord, that you would wipe away their past, that you would wipe away their past claims to their old identity. Lord, help them to see that the old man is gone and that they are new creations, that they have authority and boldness. They have strength. They are fully equipped, fully prepared for all things that you've called them to. Lord, I pray that as they leave this place, that as they walk out these doors, that there would be a switch that was turned on, that there would be a fire, maybe a low fire, but a fire ignited deep inside of them where they hunger and thirst for a relationship with you, that they would start to enter in to relationship through communication, observation, through reading their word more intentionally and giving you the worship and praise that you deserve. God, we love you and honor you. And this morning, we're going to take a moment to give you the praise, worship, and glory that you deserve. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Can we give God praise? And then let's take a time to give him worship. Thank you for watching. When you tithe, donate, and contribute, you're partnering with Royal City Church and preaching the gospel around the world. So thank you. Before you go, make sure you turn on the notifications and hit that subscribe button. And do me a favor, share this with at least one person. You never know who might need an uplifting message. If nobody's told you today, let me be the first. I love you and God does too.